Well, hey guys and girls for that matter, uh, thank you very much for tuning in again and I appreciate the number of questions that have come through both in YouTube and the, in the comments section, uh, through Instagram, Messenger and Gmail. So I thank you for those. I'm planning to get through them all. What I have done though is I've themed them or categorised them into, um, I guess, sort of topics. And some of them are similar enough that is, it's, it's an overlap. Others are a little bit different but along a similar line of thinking. So I've just clustered them. And if it's going to be a long Q&A session, then I might look at breaking it up into a couple of separate films just to make it more appetising for those that have shorter attention spans or less time. Uh, I know what that's like having kids, so apologise if I uh, elaborate a little bit on some of the responses. Um, yeah. All right, we'll get started. So I'm going to break the topics up into firstly what motivates me uh, or as a hunter what, what, what are some of the motivations to do backpack hunting I've got one on trip planning so questions around preparation things to think about when planning a backpack hunt a little bit of talk about weather and wind and the use of thermals there's some talk or questions around rifles and calibers there's a question on red stags, which I'll probably wrap up into the planning, um, the planning section. There's a section that's going to be on training and preparation. Sorry, I'm not meaning to be rude. I'm looking through my phone where I've got all the questions logged down. I'll do a session on equipment, the use of certain pieces of hunting equipment. Uh, there's a, going to be a small section on on food preparation or cooking, and then there's a very specific question on tar management. Thank you, Zane Cameron, old mate from uh, the North Island of New Zealand who's now living over in well, uh, Warrnambool in Victoria. It's going to say Wollongong, but it's Warrnambool. And good on you, Zane. And then there's another question there on chamois, uh, a couple of questions on chamois. So we'll get started. We'll start with motivations. I think that's a, a good segue. <clears throat> Now, High Country Rob, you, you, Rob, you make me laugh a lot in some of your, your uh, comments uh, over the last few months, so I, I really appreciate you tuning in and uh, making me chuckle at times. So Rob's asked, Jamie, what first got you interested in hunting? And I figured that's a good uh, introduction and segue. It's, it's quite a broad question, but I was... I was never... I wasn't brought up from a deer hunting family, but my father, Jim, always had a 22 and a shotgun and my grandparents Betty and Bruce Fawcett from Matter Matter um, bless them both passed away now but they they owned a, a farm a dairy farm in Matter Matter where we had hares rabbits possums and it really started from probably the age of eight or nine where dad would take my brother and I barrack uh, out on the farm and we'd shoot the odd rabbit and hare and possum with either the 22 or the shotgun so from that early age I was always interested in the, the idea of hunting, firearms, uh, we got a slug gun at the age of I think 10, by the age of 12 we were using a 22 under adult supervision and it wasn't until I was probably in my 14th year, so I was in fourth form at high school in Hamilton, boarding school for that matter, where I'd sh started showing a real interest in the bigger game species like goats and eventually deer and started to gravitate towards having friends that were from farming backgrounds that had uh, feral animals on their farm and uh, I think some of the first hunts I remember where I went onto people's properties were uh, Shane Miller from Towering where I went on, on his place and shot some um, shot some goats, that was that was an eye opener. Richard Seaton's place uh, around Tauranga shooting goats. Um, Irish from Pew Pew, can't even remember your name. Gareth McLaughlin actually, that springs to mind. And just really like that notion of hunting for bigger game animals and taking the meat off. There was always a component of bringing the meat back. Then I started showing an interest in deer hunting and asked my dad if he knew anyone that was into deer hunting and he, he knew of a guy called Stan Lowe and I, I could talk about Stan Lowe on, on, a, on a topic of its own because he really did do so much for me as a, as a young man and helped me out in so many ways. Um, 
and took me under his wing uh, as, a, as a deer stalker. Will Stanlow introduced me to deer stalking in the Kaimais, which is a really thick, um, relatively flat, plateau-like uh, uh, landscape to, to learn to hunt. And so it's very easy to get lost in there. The deer stalking's very close quarters. You're looking at shots up to you know, no more than 25 metres at best. I mean, if you get into some of the open terrain where there's some slips, you can shoot further, but he never took me to those spots. It was all close quarters stuff. So for me, hunting started, deer hunting, deer stalking started at about the age of 14 to 15. It took me a good year before I shot my first deer, and then after that, it started to all come together. Uh, and then I, I progressed into doing a lot more backpack hunting trips, all on public land. I've always loved public land hunting, which I'll talk more on uh, later. But that's what first got me into it was growing up in a in a family that had access to a rural property and who knows if I would have gravitated towards hunting if there wasn't that stepping stone into a rural property so thank you for that question uh, Ben DB Ben oh this this will be a good one from one mountain man to another it would be great to hear your why what internal motivators drive you to keep you pursuing and enduring the hardship that mountain hunting brings? That's, yeah, you would understand that. In fact, anyone that hunts the mountains would understand the answer to this question. It's just, there's nothing better than that feeling of working hard for, for a hunt. Whether you're successful or not, and success is defined in so many different ways, whether it's an animal that defines your success or whether it's just uh, the achievement of getting into the top of that catchment or over the back of that catchment into new terrain or finding wallows or whatever your definition of success is, it's very easy to achieve I think with, with going into the mountains and hunting. You get an immense um, feeling of satisfaction when you spend time in the mountains and for me it's, it's that adventure. I just love exploring new terrain, public land hunting especially in New Zealand anyway, where we've got so much of it and not a lot of it's really easy to access either and I say that in terms of full drive tracks are fairly limited. Um, we've got lots of walking tracks throughout the high country and we've got luckily a good network of remote huts which provide a place of refuge but it's hard going and to get into some of those places you've got to work really hard for it and I find that extremely rewarding at the end of a big day or a big week or even a big fortnight hunting in remote alpine country extremely satisfying I come back I come back from a trip and I'm so electrified and charged on life I feel like I'm I go into those hills to recharge as a human being and that that's what motivates me I, I love spending time out in big terrain putting in the miles and feeling satisfied that anything I get is well earned so I know you would understand that Ben and I've seen some of the things that you do and I, I marvel at it you know I see that you climb mountains with very technical climbing gear and that for me you must get an immense amount of satisfaction and you do it solo uh, which is which is the ultimate sort of self test in a way um, so you must get a, a, an immense amount of satisfaction and learning of yourself through putting yourself through those challenges so Thank you for that. Dave from Hunting Arette. Now Dave and I had the pleasure of doing a podcast which I'll put in the description actually uh, a wee while ago and I really enjoyed that chat with Dave. Why is public land access for hunting so important? I guess I guess what it allows is for anybody to do it. The public land hunting, it doesn't, you don't require funds, that's not for the elite. Um, anybody can access the public land and everybody has the same chance as each other on public land. There's no uh, leg up when you're hunting on public land. There's a, an immense amount of options on public land in New Zealand and even in Victoria. So Victoria is lucky in Australia in that there's a whole lot of public land that's available for hunters to go and explore for red deer, samba, fallow, pigs, hog deer as well, although I haven't done hog deer, but sorry, my whole wife uh, distracted me there. So public land hunting is important because everyone has access to it and there's no 
there's nothing stopping you as long as you go through the right permitting processes. You get your permits, you have your license, and you abide by the rules. And that's what makes it great. It's a level playing field. And there's some great diverse terrain in that public land space. You've got alpine terrain, you've got bush terrain, you've got bush flats. Uh, it, it really, and you've got a range of different species. In New Zealand, we've got seven different deer species. We've got chamois and tar. Um, and that's all available on public land, and you don't have to pay for it. Sorry, I just had to go and pop upstairs to one of the kids who wanted another cuddle, because it's uh, night time, I've just put the kids down. But yeah, the other point is on public land, the reason why I think it's so important is that it gives everybody the opportunity to experience what it is that we hunters love doing. And, and that's exploring, having opportunities for adventure, bringing back wild game, pursuing trophies, hunting in traditionally um, historic areas and spending time in the wilderness. Public land offers a different experience to what private land can offer and for me that's immensely important. I'm a public land hunter, I don't enjoy hunting on private land as much. I have access to private land, private land sorry, and I have taken animals on private land throughout my hunting journey but I don't get that same feeling of satisfaction and hardship and challenge and experience that true wilderness feeling that you get when you're on public land and I know that there's great parcels of public land in other parts of the world um, in Europe and America and I know for anyone that's watching from those areas that I'm sure the experience and memories that they take from time away on public land is distinctly and uniquely different from hunting on ranches or stations or private land. So I think on that note it's really important for governments and associated uh, game management councils or agencies to, to really bear that in mind that access to public land hunting in New Zealand, Australia or other parts of the world is really important. Um, really important from a socio-economic uh, recreational, mental well-being, I mean there's so many reasons why being able to hunt legally and respectfully on public land is so important to to users such as myself and I don't know what I don't know what other form of outlet I would have to express uh, my energies and needs if I couldn't hunt on public land you know, I think I'd be a sorry person so, thank you Dave for that question. Davey Matthews, G'day Jamie, aside from your passion for the outdoors, hunting and adventure, and backpacking into remote places, what other factors motivate you? Would also love to hear more about your trip planning, especially when venturing into new country. I'll, I'll cover trip planning separately, but aside from your passion for the outdoors, hunting and adventure, and backpacking into remote places, what other factors motivate you? Man, I find that one hard because all of those things that you've mentioned are big, strong motivators for me. Um, I think the first motivator for me though for getting into hunting was certainly the, the concept of hunting and gathering food and bringing back food uh, for, the, for the family. So when I shot my first deer, and in fact for every deer, that I've ever taken, I've always enjoyed that element of feeling like I've earned that venison. Whether it's a roast, whether it's a tenderloin, whether it's a back steak, even whether it's just front shoulder you're going to chop up in mince for sausages um, or casserole. It's always been to provide and that sense of um, value that you're adding to your, to your family dynamic. So that was probably the biggest motivator for me. Uh, and remains to be one of the larger motivators. Nowadays though, I do get an immense satisfaction from um, capturing a hunt, whether that was through photographs and putting together articles. I used to write a lot of articles, both not only on my website, which there's a question on this later, but also in magazines. I used to love to share what hunting meant to me and hope that it might inspire and motivate others to want to check it out. And now I'm able to do that through film, so I feel like I'm immensely motivated to capture, through my lens, 
literally, the hunt and what it means to me and share that. And like I said, it's just my lens, it's my perspective. Um, I don't expect everyone to view what hunting means to them in the same way that I view it for me. Stephen, g'day Jamie, what is your most memorable hunting trip you have been on? Okay, there's, there's so many that it's really hard to put a finger on which one is my most memorable. But the one that stands out the most right now um, is the 2009 raw trip with Andre Alapati, where we, that was the trip where we covered a lot of ground over the space of about a two week period in the Southern Alps. So we were targeting red stags in the raw. And we, I just remember, I landed in New Zealand Andre was going to land the next day, he had some work issues to get over, um, some geotechnical challenges with work, and I was so keen, I couldn't wait around in Christchurch, so I just said, well I'm going to go up and do an overnighter up in some local uh, Canterbury high country, and I went up and videoed some stags and came back the next day to pick him up from the airport. I was that keen, I got up there, basically climbed in about, I don't know, probably five or six kilometres into the high country just for an overnighter and then back out that same distance and then went to the airport, picked them up and we got straight into it. And I mean we got straight into it. We covered, I think, 18 kilometres on the first day and we were doing a lot of walking at night on this trip. So we would, what we would do is we would hunt. This is why it's such a memorable trip actually because I've never hunted like it before and since at that same intensity but we would hunt during the day into productive areas and at night time we would move camp because we we're sort of hunting quite light with a fly we'd move camp at night time and we would walk reasonable distances either on river flats on tracks or along ridges that we were familiar with and over that 14 day period i can't even remember how many catchments we went into we we just were poking in and out of catchments the whole 14 days and that was on the west coast, on the east coast. We weren't walking the entire time, sometimes we would walk back out of an area, drive to another area, walk in and hunt. I think we hunted four different areas in that two week time frame but we covered 187 kilometres on foot and I lost 11 kilos of body weight and I was already reasonably lean at the time so I got down to a uh, 71 kilos which for me is crazily light and Andre lost nine kilos and that was just through sheer hard work grit determination um, on, on the one particular night that I shot a really good stag which was I don't know it's probably a week into the trip we'd been going for quite a while before we saw the stag we went through the worst climb on earth and still to this day we call it the Blair Witch climb because it was just horrible subalpine scrub knitted together beach forest that was um, just very difficult to push through with a with pack because we were carrying everything on that journey and we got to the top we were just using bivy bags so no fly just a bivy bag we had a fly stashed but it was good weather so we didn't we didn't need that um, fly that night and Andre spotted a really good stag right on last light about 250 meters below camp so it was my turn to do the shot so we've always had turns and I shot that stag it was a 13 pointer it was a really nice head um, not a real long head I've shot longer but it was just beautiful symmetrical legitimate true require strain uh, wild red stag and the next day or no maybe two or three days later yeah it was a couple of days later we'd seen a couple of good stags actually after that and we just couldn't quite make it count and then it all came together on one evening for Andre where he took a, a really nice heavy timbered red stag which was 10 points and uh, that trip I mean that trip we worked our butts off to get in we worked our butts off to get out and everything about it just was so memorable for so many reasons you know we pushed ourselves we were rewarded and we just got so much satisfaction from that and it really it really brought us closer as mates too because I know that there's one other person in this world that really understood what that trip involved, and that's Andre. And I captured it on, on camera and have done uh, the best that I can to portray it with the footage that I took, but nothing beats being there and doing it 
and that trip for that reason is the one that's the most memorable. But I've had lots of memorable trips. I don't want to undermine the other trips that I've had with other people um, because they're all so unique in their own way. But that trip definitely stands out. That's the one that I'll be telling as an old man um, to the young fellas, you know, as the one to, yeah, but it wasn't like the trip me and Andre did, you know? So anyway, thanks for that question. Um, PJ Bradford, good on you PJ. If you could pick one hunting adventure or trip to relive again, what would it be? Well, it would be it would be that trip, but the moment that I'd want to relive again, what moment would I want to relive? Um, a particular moment in time. That's also a really hard one. Probably my first Samba Stag, actually. Yeah, shooting my first Samba Stag, that was a really... Um, Bag, mixed bag of emotions, mainly because we were backpacking into the Alpine National Park, it was August, it was very cold, there was a lot of snow everywhere here. I was hunting in the National Park with Andre Alapati, a guy called Brad Olzarski and Stefano, and Brad had actually kindly invited me to go and hunt with him on this backpack trip. And he's a Samba guru, the guy really knew his stuff and I was just trying to be a sponge. Uh, taking it all in and we'd got into this area we'd been in there for a night the first morning first full morning once we were into the location we were walking up a track together and we came across a whole heap of sign and I just said boys what are you planning to do I want to head up here where I can see fresh sign and so I peeled off the rest of the three kind of went hunting up the valley um, and they had success Andre actually shot a, a really old stag which was going backwards uh, in my opinion it was a very old stag with um, deformed antlers by that point that morning anyway i sidled up into a series of gullies and within i don't know probably half an hour managed to come onto a group of, of uh, samba that were just sort of nestled into a thicket of wasn't really dogwood it was just a thicket of bush but it was in a relatively open because the fires had burnt through there the year before or maybe a couple of years before but it was very open and there were a little few thickets in those sort of lower parts of the catchment that were I presume sheltered from that that wind that was probably ripping fire through so these samba uh, having had read about them and being told by by Brad a lot about samba before the trip uh, in terms of you know don't expect to find them in the open areas. Look in the thickets near the open areas. They're not like conventional deer where, where there's good feed, that's where the deer will be. They don't, they don't do that until the night time. So this was all sort of bubbling through my mind. Came in, found some deer, thought cool, I'm in the area. Watched them until I actually started to get borderline hypothermia. I watched them for an hour. I took a, quite a number of photos, um, just hoping that a stag would come out and I could see four or five deer in that sort of thicket and in the end I actually backtracked away from them and just left them without spooking them and carried on and as soon as I got into that next gully that was probably 200 metres further in uh, into this catchment I got onto a stag, it honked at me, I got the fright of my life, let off a shot, I reckon I I reckon I let the shot off before I even put the scope to my, it was very close, it was about 12 metres away, just honked right in front of me and tore off so that was the first stag. Second stag was a stag that, it was interesting, I was walking through the bush and I could hear this strange bird making a whole lot of noise and I just thought that sounds so odd for, it's, it's an unnatural sound for a bird, it just sounded like something was, you know, raking it up. So I quietly snuck into where this bird was making a noise and I was looking around and then eventually I just saw antlers hanging in the tree and I was like, holy hell! Someone shot a stag and left the antlers in the tree. And so I just pulled the, oh, I pulled the scope up actually, not the binos, pulled the scope up, and I could see these antlers were like, actually like this. And I was like, that's a really weird way to hang antlers in a tree. And as I was thinking, hang on a second, and I was about to clip like, hang on a second, that's a stag looking at me. The stag honked and tore off, and I had two shots at it as it was running away, but they actually run a lot faster than what I gave them credit for, so I reckon both of those shots were a clean miss. I followed that animal's tracks for probably 300 metres and there was no blood whatsoever. I could hear it crashing for as far as, as, uh, as the catchment went. And so that was the second animal. The third animal was probably one of the better ones. I 
this is probably all the reasons why I shouldn't be remembering the hunt right, but I'll get to the reason why I do remember it uh, soon. As I'd, I, I was sitting up on this nice sort of um, head of a small gut, it wasn't a gully, I was at the head of a small gut, I was on stag sign, and I could hear the noise of something moving in the bush. So I just sat tight, it was cold, it was starting to drizzle, it was snow everywhere, snow was down to 800 metres. And what was happening is the deer were kind of condensed down to below that snow line, which is why I think me sidling in and out of all these gullies at that snow line was so productive. But anyway, I sat there for about 15 minutes and eventually I saw what was making the noise and it was a wild dog. And I was like, oh, what a bloody, just wasted 15 minutes sitting here to see a wild dog. So I got up, the dog kind of meandered off down below me, still unaware because the thermals were working up. And I took probably eight steps in the direction of where I was heading, wanting to go, and I just saw a big stag stand up out of its bed. I straight away lifted the rifle, and that just honked and also took off. So that was that was the that was the third stag. I had one shot at that as it was running, and I have no idea where that shot went either. But I followed that for probably nearly half a kilometre actually, because it ran through quite a lot of snow before then cutting down into the river. And by that stage. The third shot Andre had heard and Brad were like, what are you doing, like that shot, we heard that shot, you over near us, I said no, I'm still on the opposite side of the whole gap, the whole system, Andre told me that he'd shot a good stag, an old stag, but he'd shot one, and by that stage I had no confidence in this rifle that I was actually using, it was a lint rifle, and I don't want to blame the rifle, it was me the operator, but I had lost confidence in the rifle and felt like I needed to swap the rifle. In my mind, that's what I was thinking. This rifle is not shooting accurately. I've never missed so many deer in my life and I've missed three already today. So Andre said, I'll come over, I'll swap you the 300 Magnum for his 306 that he was borrowing. And this was all under the supervision of Brad. So I take the 306, Andre and I, start to cut up onto more stag sign and within about 15 minutes of bumping into Andre which was quite a wee way away further into the catchment from where I'd shot at that third stag uh, I got on we got onto two more stags and that but they were mid 20 stags these two one ran straight up the other one ran straight round I didn't get a chance to shoot at either of those we just saw them both break off didn't honk just broke and crashed off and I thought well the one that's gone up is going to continue to smell us because our, our scent was blowing up but the one that kind of crashed away from us we, we said let's, let's follow that and we followed that sign for about I don't know 300 400 meters until it came into this this whole new sort of fold in the landscape whether it was the same animal or a different one I suspect it was a totally different animal that we saw but we saw another stag which was on the opposite side of this this gut so we'd sold around into this big gut and it was with about four or five hinds at 200 metres away and it was just feeding its way, poking its head through little patches of snow and I lined that up and I put that shot right into its spine. It was facing directly away, aim top of the shoulder, bullet would have just smacked it in the spine, it reared up on its back legs and kind of fell over on itself and then tore off straight downhill crashing like hell. I sounded like a bulldozer going down through the scrub. And Andre and I, we high five, we rolled around, we were stuck. I'd shot my first stag as far as I was concerned. Got over there, we tracked it. Um, didn't find, just found the odd speck of blood, but didn't find a lot, you know. And I guess maybe what had happened is the bullet had gone into its into its back cavity and just never came out, so it wasn't bleeding from any, any organs that had an exit wound to bleed out of. That was the only explanation I could have. And I spent, we spent until dark trying to find that stag and because there was so much deer sign we sort of ended up losing the sign uh, losing that animal in amongst the sign down on the actual river flats and I went back the following day so that was the fourth stag and that was all on the same day um, no hang on that was the fifth stag that was the fifth stag because I'd shot at three I'd missed a chance at four and I'd then hit five and so I went back to camp feeling pretty down about Samba hunting, thinking, man, you know, didn't make any of them count, feeling pretty low. The next morning, Brad had said to me, look, let's go back up and we'll grid search the area for the stag. So we went back straight to the area, we grid searched it for about four hours, 
until it was midday and by that stage Brad was like man I don't know where the stag's gone either I couldn't I just couldn't work it out we'd done such a big sort of arc of the area that I gave up on it and thought well I don't know what what to do otherwise fast forward two or three months some hound hunter found it and it went 28 or 28 and a half inches it was a nice symmetrical stag I've seen photos of it thanks to uh, to the source and that would have been the first but anyway I left Brad at midday and I decided to stuff it I'm going to carry on further up and I'm going to do the same as what I've been doing which is sidling in and out of cat catchments and gullies and spending that time at around eight to nine hundred meters which was just below snow level got all the way through till pretty much the last 45 minutes of light and I was quite far away from camp I probably at that stage would have been nearly six or seven kilometers from camp which isn't too concerning but because it was still new to me that terrain and it was really cold that was on my mind a little bit and I'd broken up from, from Brad at that stage so Brad had kind of hunted back down towards camp into a, a different side of the catchment and I was poking around through the, the high country and found uh, a really nice sort of old thicket of blackberry that had you know had died away but there was just blackberry and I just remember thinking oh blackberry okay you hear about a lot of you know animals liking blackberry in the, in the spring and summertime so well, maybe this is a good area to spend some time in and I was just starting to think those thoughts when I heard a big stick snap and I stopped and did some glassing couldn't see moved a bit closer did some more glassing, another stick broke, and I thought there's definitely an animal here. And it was just a matter of changing angles, and then eventually I saw onto this face on the other side of this river, which was making a lot of noise, but I could still hear the sticks breaking because they were up a bit higher and the noise was carrying over. And there was this big stag with two uh, younger stags with it. It didn't have hinds, it was just three stags on this face, and I was just like, finally, I've got all the time in the world I set up, I lined up, I just put my rifle on a tree, standing up, I didn't lie down, I was only 80 metres away, standing on a tree, decided I'm going to just give this right in the shoulder and I'm going to reload and give it another shot. By this stage I was using the 300 Magnum, I'd gone back to the 300 Magnum, and I don't know if we'd checked this zero back at camp, but anyway, I was using the 300 Magnum, it might have been one of Brad's other ones. Boom, hit it, loaded, boom, hit it again and loaded for the third time but the stag didn't crash out of that face and the other two just kind of disappeared and that was the moment that I would relive again because of all of those mixed emotions and feelings that had happened the day before and it was just so, that was the first hunt in, in Australia for Samba in the high country too so to just put in practice these uh, the foundations of of deer stalking principles in place in Australia and for it to work was just a really satisfying feeling in that moment that was all that was going through so a long elaborate answer but that's the moment that I would relive again because if you persevere and push past all those mental games and you really can get in your own head when things aren't going well you think you've stuffed up the last opportunity on a hunt and think it can't possibly happen again well it can if you're willing to make it happen and keep pushing on and so I think that's a that's a pretty key message to take away from it for me anyway was just never give up keep going eventually do the miles reap the smiles and in that case I was very fortunate to uh, come away with a good one Aussie Outdoors what would you class as the most personally challenging game to pursue Oh, I want to say two. Initially I want to say Samba because the thing that's so challenging with Samba is that while they've got some, you know, behavioural traits that can arguably be um, predict predicted or predictable, there's so much unpredictability about them as well. They really are the one game animal that I've hunted. In saying that, I've hunted Samba, uh, Wapiti or Elk, Red Deer, Fallow, Seeker, well Roe Deer over in Europe, um, Chamois Tar, Pigs the usual, 
And of all of those species, I feel like in terms of the animal and patterning them and working them out and feeling like you totally have a recipe for success, Samba is the one animal that I feel like I haven't quite got that recipe for success. I've got things that work often, some things that work sometimes, a lot of things that did work that don't work. Just the number of questions that keep coming out of hunts with Samba are phenomenally more than the answers that I feel like I get um, from trips. So for me, Samba would be the animal that I find the most challenging. In terms of the hunt though, it'd have to be tar. Just because of the terrain and the physical demands that can be put upon you if you hunt them during pretty much from say April, March, April, because March they're up very high still, March, April through till August, September, but certainly through till August, you know, they're up high, uh, there can be snow during this sort of winter time, which is really demanding, and it can be dangerous, and for that reason, tar would have to be the pick of the hardest game animal to hunt. Um, but I'd also throw in, you know, Wapiti and Fiordland. Wapiti and Fiordland are extremely challenging. You've got some of the most challenging terrain to hunt in and some of the highest rainfall to hunt in uh, in the world. So Fiordland, Wapiti would also be up there. So that's motivations done. I'm probably going to have to just park that there.